Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're gonna do some odd jobs around the garden. It's just about go time for us to be able to put all of our annual plants in, uh, perennials, anything that uh, we needed to wait for our average last frost date for. Our average last frost date's coming up this weekend. Uh, 15th-ish is, is our normal average last frost date. And then we look at the, you know, look out into the future. And right now for the 10-day forecast, very mild for as far out as we can see. So we're gonna jump in and start planting some of those things, but we got a little bit of prep we need to do. Uh, we still need to do a little prep in the garden. We'll talk about that during the video. And we'll also talk about some cool plants uh, in this video as well. And I've uh, got three new t-shirts and I actually am selling them direct off of the website, horttube.com. If you wanna go and take a look at those, this is the first one um, that's up so far. There's conifer collector, plant collector, and a new ACA uh, t-shirt. If you wanna take a look at those over on the website, we'll start with this Aeschylus pavia, which is red buckeye. This is a native to the Southeast United States. Love this particular plant because it came from Ram Giberson's garden. She never lets you leave that garden without any, without taking home plants. So hello, Ram, if you're watching this video. Unfortunately, in yesterday's wind, I'm holding this up for a reason. Uh, we had a big wind storm come through. We were lucky in comparison to what happened down in Louisiana and other places in the country. So, um, you know, the fact that I have to cut my red buckeye in half and let it start over in the growth is literally nothing in comparison to what other people went through. Uh, Love red buckeyes. They're native to the Southeast United States, but are extremely cold hardy. You'll see a lot of plants like this that are native in the Southeast, but are much, much more cold hardy. Had another one in the um, video earlier in the week, and that's our um, uh, native fringe tree is that way. You can see the long tubular flowers. And when you see this kind of tubular flower, you know that that's an, an invitation to a hummingbird or a butterfly. Uh, this is plant is toxic. This is one of those plants that you, you know, when you talk about it, I don't talk about toxicity in plants very much. I think it's kind of overdone, but there are some plants that are actually poisonous uh, that are, you know, so th this, this one is one of those. Uh, our native buckeye um, can get some size on it. it. It's basically an understory tree, part shade uh, and is kind of best. And our neighborhood is kind of an understory kind of a place. You know, there's never going to be a spot that's going to get 15 hours of direct sun, but it gets plenty out here. Uh, so half and half, if you've got a space for that, it's kind of ideal for them. If you go over to Europe during the late spring and early summer, the European buckeyes get gigantic, like 125 feet, just absolutely gigantic. They bloom for a long, long time. They're just interesting uh, how much taller that plant gets than our native um, red buckeyes. But these kind of fit our gardens perfectly. Really, you know, love the foliage. You know, you just get this, it's one of the more interesting foliage plants if it never flowered. Uh, it wouldn't need to. It's blooming a little early this year, just like everything is blooming a little earlier this year. This everything for the everything for the hummingbirds is kind of a little ahead of the hummingbirds. Uh, but there you go. We're going to jump around and take a look at some other interesting things in the garden here. One big change we've made this spring is we had the very large sunshine ligustrum over there on the other side of the garden, and I, we have I think currently 13 different plants. Uh, in that screen over there where the neighbor is. Some, some of it's grown much faster than other things. But there was one little section over there where between the Snowball Viburnum and the Osmanthus fragrance and the Carolina Midnight Loripetalum, uh, it was just really, really tight in there for the Sunshine Ligustrum to really be able to show off. So like we wanted it to, I was, con I was either gonna have to constantly prune it or you know, it was just better. So we took that one out and actually uh, put it out on the put it out on the road on Facebook Marketplace, and somebody picked it up uh, and 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 took it away. Uh, and I've got another one here. The, and the main reason I didn't just transplant that one over here is it had a big gap on the back of it, and the spot we're moving it to over here, I wanted to be able to. I had this one, <laughs> and it looks fresh all the way around. So we gave the other one away, and it'll be fine as soon as it grows out from you know having its back been covered up for all that time no problem at all but anyway got another one and these are we like to have these chartreuse things out in long range angles in the garden so if you stand on the back porch up there you can see these chartreuse things out in the distance or they're highlighting other things around them so just a great plant for that uh, as you all know i mean it's probably one of the 
top plants out in the world. This is a, uh, it's a Chinese privet, but it's not, it doesn't seed, so it's not invasive like the other, like other Chinese privet. There was a, uh, if you've been following along with these odd jobs videos, there was a pretty large fig right here. It got moved this past week and this opened up this spot. We have a Japanese maple that's gonna be going in here and the sunshine ligustrum here. Everything will have plenty of room in the future. With the sunshine ligustrum, you can keep it any size you wanna keep it really. But over there, it was just too tight of a space to keep it any shape that I wanted to keep it. This soil is so crazy. I have to go, let's see if we can find it. I'm gonna go way deep down in there, show it to you. This is how deep I have to go now to find solid clay. You see the layer right there, right there. But you see how deep I had to go down there to find it? It's unbelievable how much this even surprises me. I mean, I'm sitting here teaching people <laughs> how to improve their soil. But at the old house, it was like 23 years uh, to accomplish this. And here, because we used the wood chips uh, and some soil cube compost, it was uh, it's dramatically different. This thing has been in this pot for like two years. Totally my fault. This has basically become solid roots. Again, I had this plant for about two years and hadn't done anything with it. Uh, it was going to go in a container project and then it didn't and then we just watered it for two years and here here we are uh, i will take on something like this where the roots get mat this matted down at the bottom i will actually saw this entire uh, basically root cake off the bottom this is a pretty good technique for getting a lot of these roots heading outward we see that it's a solid disc of roots uh, and then I'll take and cut from the top to the bottom, just like this. Now I'm gonna have to water this plant a little bit more because of the amount of damage I'm doing to the roots, but I'm planting on a cloudy day. It's cool outside. I wouldn't do this type of surgical work on a day in the middle of July. But there you go. All of these roots now will head out and about Gotta dig this hole just a hair deeper. But that's a pretty extreme root bound situation right there. We haven't seen much of that in a few years because plants have been selling so fast. <laughs> they haven't had time to get root bound in the containers. It's not quite straight. Now it is. And I'll use the mulch just to fill in that extra, extra little bit of space at the top of the root ball. Perfect. Obviously I'm gonna have to keep an eye on this one for the next few days, water it in really, really well. The soil I'm putting it in is moist. I didn't put it in a dry condition, so good to go. This is Blatilla striata, which is a ground orchid. And despite the fact that the orchid family, the Orchidaceae is it, either it or the Aster family, the Asteraceae uh, are the largest families on earth. It's kind of argued back and forth, but they both have over 30,000 different species. Uh, within the groups. We don't have a lot of these orchids. Despite how many there are on earth, not a lot of them grow up, almost all of them grow in tropical areas. Very few of them grow from the ground, like this one. This one has a pseudo bulb. It's not a bulb, but it's similar to a bulb structure under the ground. And they're actually hardy all the way up to zone five. You do need to mulch them in the winter time if you're in colder areas to make sure that they survive the uh, winter. They like kind of moist, well-drained conditions, which, you know, a part in part shade. So that sometimes can be hard to find a space for them. Uh, we have them, you know, this is a fairly well mulched area and it's an easy one for us to water if we happen to need to water it. You'll notice that this one has a variegated leaf. So right on the edge of the leaf, uh, it has a bit of a white variegation. You'll see these with slightly more variegation. You'll see the variegated ones blooming with white flowers. This one has more of a pink flower. And then we have the regular green uh, one as well. There are other, Again, there are other species of ground orchids, but there, we don't have a lot of them that we can grow up in more temperate areas where we get actual winter occurring. So it's just kind of fun to say you have an orchid in your garden. If you've been following along with the channel, you know that we put a lot of shrubs and ground covers and 
grasses and grass-like plants and everything into the vegetable garden for the winter time just to store them because uh, we were out of town so much that we didn't want to water them. And this has been a fantastic storage facility uh, for the last uh, four months, but it's got to go and it's got to go in a hurry. We're about to pull flats out of the house that we've where we started seed. Uh, last week's video we did from visiting Big Bloomers uh, Garden Center. We have uh, a lot of stuff that's going in the ground from them. Our vegetable next week is our average last frost dates around April 15th, April 10th to April 15th. It's all over the place. Some people say as early as April 1st, and some people I think I've always said April 15th for us in our area here in Raleigh. And I, as long as I'm looking at the 10-day forecast beyond that, I'll go ahead and put things in the ground that are you know the, the annuals in the ground. We got in two bags of soil cube compost. One was a veggie mix which you will have seen the video before this one, you will have seen us using in the uh, front garden. The veggie mix has a little bit of bark in it. Uh, it's the humus compost like this, but then it has some bark mixed in with it. Uh, great material for containers. We filled our containers with it and we did the uh, front annual beds with it. But here in the vegetable garden, <laughs> we actually just used the, uh, the humus, which we've used all along. And I, I took, emptied the bag out there on the driveway, brought a bunch of it right here. And as soon as the rest of these shrubs are out of the ground and it needs to happen very, very soon, I gotta get the rest of this material out of here. I'll spread this compost and we'll get the vegetable plants in the ground. But this soil cube compost, I've got it linked down below. It's, it's uh, North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia is where it's available to you. But any kind, you know, any kind of organic material you can add to these annual beds, at least once a year, you know, once every two years at a minimum, I would think. The thing with their annual beds that make them different, and I, I'm vegetable plants and flowering annuals are all the same, right? Uh, these things that we're trying to get one season of growth out of, uh, I, those are the things I amend the soil more frequently on. Just I, not a lot of fertilizer. We don't push things with a lot of fertilizer, but this, uh, this material here, of course, has a lot of uh, nutrients in it. Uh, but we try to improve the soil for those spaces so that we can get the most out of them in a single season we can. We got six months, right? So, you know, let's go, let's go for it. Holly's figured out, no matter where this camera's facing, Holly figures out how to get on camera. So let's head to the front garden and uh, do another transplant. This is one of our great show pieces here in the garden. It's, it's in a prominent space next to the screen porch. It's all where two paths meet or the, pat, the future patio and a path meet. And it's a real show off. This is a Wajila. This one's called uh, this one is Lumanzii aurea, which is gold foliage. Uh, it needs some protection from the direct sun where we think about Wajila being totally tolerant of being out in the full sun. This one, because of this gold foliage, needs a little bit of protection from the direct sun or it bleaches during the summertime. And we'll get a little bit of bleaching on the top of this. You'll get that on some gold uh, chartreuse plants, uh, conifers and other things. If you don't give them here in the south a little bit of afternoon protection, so this one gets the sun's coming over and it's in the sun, direct sun for three or four hours. And it's enough to bleach it a bit by the end of summer. No complaints though. This is a fantastic plant. It's got that great arching habit. It's got kind of purplish buds. It's not in full bloom by any stretch of the imagination, but it's got this, these almost purple buds that then open to this pink or white center. And they show off against this chartreuse foliage. They're so bright and showy. We put it in front of a, a darker foliage Wajila behind it, a shining sensation. And we'll talk about more about this one once it comes into full flower. It's just, it's butted up, but you, you can't see it, uh, see it quite yet. The, the combo of that purple and gold. And I'll frequently talk about a, a lot of these purple foliage plants. And you know, I talk about Laura Petalum quite a bit. Uh, some of the darker foliage, um, Japanese maples are an example of this. Darker foliage, this Wajila, any of these dark foliage plants, sometimes you would put them in the garden and they disappear. You know, you put them in a park shade space or a space that has long shadows and you walk 25 feet away from them. You can't see them all that well. So it's good to pair them with brighter colored things or at least green for sure. Uh, and that really allows this black foliage, Wajilia, to sh show off a little more. Just the, the contrast between the two is super, super showy. This one, I would imagine here in the south that this thing would get 10 feet tall if I just let it over time. I think the tag 
or most websites say this one gets about four to six feet by four to six feet. It's got kind of an open weeping habit. When we prune it, rather than meatballing it, you know, we'll trace these limbs down into the center of the plant a bit and make sure that it keeps this kind of free form to it. We've moved this one. This is a plant that's been abused. We would we act like plants are chest pieces, chest pieces in the garden, and we move them about. Uh, and in this one, it took three, I think this was the third spot it landed in, had too much shade initially and was stretching and wasn't flowering, then too much sun, and then we just landed it in the perfect spot. And it's just such a great showpiece here on the corner. These flowers, you know, are for, supposed to be for hummingbirds and butterflies, but here in our garden in Raleigh, they kind of beat the butterflies and the, and the hummingbirds to the punch every year. So it has that shape of a flower for it, but uh, we really, they don't get to take advantage of it here in our Raleigh garden. Typically it'll be bloomed out when we're, when we're peak hummingbird uh, season out here, but just an absolute showpiece here in the garden. I highly recommend this one, but you gotta have the right spot for it. You gotta have a spot that's going to uh, allow it to uh, not, not cook in the afternoon sun. I think you can see all three tree formed shrubs out here in the front garden. The Shasta viburnum over there, the Rosalinda Indian hawthorn and the Miss Kim lilac is in full bloom. These two are fragrant and they're really, really fragrant, uh, uh, filling up the entire front garden. But you can see this little trio uh, all limbed up into small trees, how good this looks as they're all in full bloom. We had cut the Shasta viburnum and the Miss Kim lilac hard two years ago. And they didn't bloom as well last year. Uh, and of course this Rosalinda was just smaller, but now they're all three kind of what we envisioned uh, for them uh, on this side of the garden. And we'll continue to limb them up and make ground space up under them. Now that the uh, foundation is available for planting, we have this uh, Snowbells Camellia. This is a Camellia handleye. Most of us are familiar with Camellia sasanquas, which are fall blooming, and then Camellia japonicas, which tend to bloom after the first of the year, with some exceptions. There's always exceptions. Uh, horticulture is just sh should be called, it, it, sh it should stand for with exceptions. That, that's actually what it should mean. Um, but this, uh, this com particular Camellia species gets tons of, they're smaller flowers, but it gets so many white flowers on it. It's really quite beautiful. You can see it has more of a weeping open habit where most of our other camellias are going to be kind of rigid, uh, upright. It's got a very different foliage than we would see on uh, Camellia sasanquas and Camellia japonicas. Camellia japonica has a leaf that's, you know, 10 times bigger, uh, you know, than, than, than that. And then uh, uh, sasanqua is about half, half as big as, uh, uh, half as big as japonicas. But anyway, very different foliage. I love the new growth on this thing. It has this kind of lime green, lighter colored foliage on it. I'm going to move it and I probably, the time to prune camellias is now. Um, you can get a little, if you need to shear them or prune them a bit, this is the time to do it. So they have time to grow back out of it and reset buds for whether they bloom in the fall or the spring or whenever they bloom. If they've got just a crazy limb on them that's racing away from everything, you can track that one limb down in the, into the plant and cut it off, and that's totally fine uh, to just do that. That can be done kind of any time, you know, uh, to, to, to rebalance the plant. But what I've got to do, because I've waited a little longer than I should have, I need to do a little bit of general pruning on the tips of these branches before I move it. Because again, all the water from this plant and all you know, it, it's all being used in this newest growth and it's absolutely covered in new growth. So I'm just gonna lighten it up basically. Uh, but you can see as it branches out, I'm, we're about to give this thing a little more room so we can just let it take this natural weeping habit. I'm not trying to prune this thing into a meatball ultimately like I'm doing this morning, uh, but I'll let it grow right back out of this. But I'm just trying to take, I'm not gonna get every branch here but I'm, most, most branches that have lots of new growth on the end of them, I'm just gonna give them a little bit of a haircut. That will stop this plant from using so much water for the next few weeks while it gets itself rooted back in the ground. And I'm, again, I'm not, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna get every little branch, but I'm gonna get the majority of them. And I think that'll be fine right there and then we're going to move it up here onto the foundation we moved in another video uh, a couple of days ago as you're watching this a 
sweet viburnum up to one side and then there's a gap in the middle there's plants laying all over the place that we're going to be planting i wood chipped up here we got a load of wood chips and i had never this foundation area just becoming available to us to plant uh, i put down wood chips here they've already i mean it's amazing how fast the soil can start to start to break them down but i don't want any of this wood mixed in to the to the soil down there it can become anaerobic if you mix this these this wood part of the tree down in the ground pretty deep especially with our clay based soil even though we have to go down a little bit to find the clay it's down there and this wood will make the soil anaerobic if it's buried if it doesn't have light uh and it doesn't have air uh it will break down in a weird way more it just and it will turn the soil kind of funky uh, so I got to pull this stuff pretty far back. Uh, you know, a little bit gets in there. I'm not, I'm not that paranoid about it, but again, I don't want a bunch of this wood falling down in there. Uh, we had a snow joey viburnum that we transplanted in a video maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and it was leaning on the side of this a bit. And so this is another thing that's going to be super helpful for the snowbells camellia is now it's going to have more, it's going to have its own space. Uh, this went easier than I thought it was going to go. There's a lot of roots up in here from uh, a couple maples that ran roots all up through here. And there's still roots here, but I must have broken them already. Because this soil up here is completely sandy from the const original construction from this house. They, for some reason, backfilled the whole thing with a bunch of sand. That was pretty good <laughs> without having to do anything really right uh, that was a uh, that was a good guess you can see what one of these maples can do it's just unbelievable how this entire front garden is either like this these really fine roots or ones i pulled out a couple days ago we've already uh, disposed of but you know ones this big around maple does both it puts these big giant roots out and it puts the the fibrous roots out as well so here we go uh, i don't even think this will have any transplant shot doing this on a cloudy it's mild but it's not hot by any stretch of the imagination it's gonna be cloudy for the next couple of days soil's moist uh, it was moist when it came out of the ground make sure you're watering something a few days before you're moving it that's something i should probably say in these transplanting things make sure it, that it's moist where it's going from and moist where it's heading to Again, cutting it back, giving it a haircut like this, is that's the game changer. If I left all that new foliage on here, it'd almost certainly be wilting this afternoon because I cut 50% of the roots off of it for sure. You know, at least, a, at least a third of the roots got damaged there. And so therefore, but there it goes. It's in its new home. It's gonna have plenty of room. We don't have to really think about it uh, anymore. It's not, nothing leaning on it. It was always kind of, there's a, several plants in this garden. You'll notice throughout the next two or three weeks as we're, We've gained all this space, all this foundation space. We gained front corner space. We gained a back corner space. We're gaining spaces that we had had as basically we were waiting to do other projects. And so now that those spaces are available, we can kind of do two things. Opportunity to bring in some new things, and you'll see that, but also take some of the existing things and put them in an arrangement that makes a little more sense for the individual plants to be able to thrive. We have one plant that's about to go in on the back line, but I figured by the time we planted it, we wouldn't have it out here in full flower. So again, I'm actually almost past peak. This is one of the Southgate rhododendrons. Uh, there are four maybe in this group of uh, rhododendrons. They're incredibly heat tolerant rhododendrons. It's actually that one of the issues we have, you know, removing these, you know, from mountainous areas and cooler areas of the country is just heat. Uh, and then of course, in our flat clay soils, we also have an issue with Phytophthora root rot um, is one issue we can get on them. So we mound them up a little bit when we plant them and then hope for the best normally, but these have been bred for heat tolerance. These are in the Southern Living Plant Collection. This one is Southgate Breeze and it starts with these bright, super, super bright pink buds. And then as they open they're pink and then they fade more toward white over time and you can see that that color change happening uh, right there's a newer slightly newer flower with more pink in it and then over time become whiter and whiter and these are just the most heat tolerant rhododendrons i was down at the hammond research station in hammond louisiana which is 
just on the north side of Lake Pontchartrain and it is, it is hot and humid and not a place that you think you'd see rhododendrons and these were just in absolutely perfect shape down there a few years ago. I'm just amazed by that and ours on the back line that we have planted is also looking great. I took, I, we have an issue back there where it's drier than we expected it to be initially and we didn't, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So we missed watering some things on that back line initially and this thing took a set, our, the first of these Southgate rhododendrons that we planted, took a little setback all on us, just not watering them. Now it's established and it's got tons of new growth on it. So excited about having another one from this series because again, the heat tolerance of, you know, the, the heat tolerance of this Southgate series allows us to have rhododendrons in our gardens down here in the flatlands of North Carolina. So one of the things we're doing this week is getting our trays out from the light racks in the house. I think we started six trays of vegetables and annual flowers and some perennial flowers inside. We like to pick kind of a cloudy day, which it is today, uh, to bring them out initially because even though they're on the light rack in the house, there's just, it, they'll still burn when you bring them outdoors uh, if you bring them and put them directly in a full day sunlight. So we bring them out on a cloudy day, let them sit out here for a few days. One thing you wanna be careful of is a severe thunderstorm with these trays, these, although the, the seedlings are rooted into the trays, they're not rooted in enough necessarily to hold up to a two or three inch rain. They can get destroyed. Uh, so we'll be careful not to have them in a thunderstorm or anything like that initially. Uh, they'll stay out here uh, maybe three, four or five hours the first day or two, and then they can be in the full sun after that. But there's the six trays uh, Steph has brought out and we'll have them on this back porch let them get some sunlight, let them build up over a few days so we don't sunburn them, and then they'll get planted out into the vegetable garden. And this has made room on the light racks inside for some of the things that just don't take very long at all from seed. So we start off with peppers every year, which takes six to eight weeks, and a few perennials that take six to eight weeks, uh, and then slowly but surely get down to the things that can just germinate really, really quickly. And for us, one of those things is zinnias, uh, and so we've done three trays of zinnias because we we do lots of them uh, in the house and then that uh, that will be uh that'll be the next th maybe two two three weeks they can come out and go go in the ground uh, we're so we're transitioning these trays and then we have a ton of other material and i mean a ton of other material we had uh we had uh, uh mr maple unboxing a plant delights unboxing we've gotten a bunch of stuff from uh, plantsbymail.com. We've gone down to Big Bloomers, which was in a video last week, and gotten a bunch of annuals to supplement all the ones that we do from seed and some perennials and some shrubs. So it's just an ocean of material that we will be planting. And really, the next two weeks is when all that's the vast, vast majority of that's getting done, plus our containers as well. So lots and lots of things to look forward to here in the next two weeks. And good amount of work, but we enjoy it. And uh, at the end of this, we should have checked off quite a bit. And then, you know, this patio that's directly in front of me and the uh, fence are the next jobs after that. But we've got about two weeks of, I think, it just intense planting with the number of things that we have uh, to do. Uh, but we've, you know, I think we've moved it forward quite a bit in the last six weeks and we'll continue to do so. As you can see in the video, we are all in on trying to get everything prepped for annuals and it's that time this next couple of weeks we have a ton of things we did from seed for the vegetable garden and a ton of things that we did for the uh, uh for the you know for the flower spaces as well uh, i get this question all the time you know about vegetables versus you know flowering you know flowers and other parts of gardening there's not a lot of difference between what I do for a vegetable garden and I do for any type of gardening. We do a lot of soil improvement and we keep the ground covered and we allow things to break down to feed those plants, you know, nat yeah, um, naturally and, and with a lot less fertilizer. So when I get questions about, you know, there's, there's very specific channels for vegetable channels and there's very specific channels for horticulture, you know, for this ornamental landscaping that we show off on the channel, I just don't see there's a lot of difference between the two. I mean, the way I treat um, annual flowers is the exact same way I treat tomatoes. There's just not a lot of difference between it. So I wanna kind of put that 
you know, in people's minds that there's just not a lot of difference between the two. There's no reason, real reason to separate them as much as we separate them. Like there's some sort of magic difference between growing uh, food versus growing flowering shrubs, perennials, annuals, trees, whatever in our gardens as well. Uh, so we'll finish this video up talking about this fuzzy dutzia or uh, um, this is dutzia scabra variegata. This is a very, it's a variegated dutzia that can get this thing can get six or eight feet tall eventually it can be hard it can be pruned in the future to control its size but it is variegated doesn't get the fall color that the slender dutzia gets but it doesn't really need to because it's variegated and it's super long bloomed it's just coming into flower now these really really bright white flowers that the bees absolutely love in the afternoons out here we're filming this in the morning but in the afternoon the bees are all over this plant there's a uh, a viburnum, a sweet viburnum behind it that's about to move back. This thing is about to finally own a piece of real estate that it will enjoy. It's been moved a couple of times in the, around the garden. It's landed in this spot. This is a great backdrop for a perennial and annual border. Uh, it's just really bright, vivid foliage. Allows other things in front of it to stand out, especially like pinks and purples and things like that. Uh, you know, to really stand out. There's some pansies actually in front of it there. Of course, the rabbits have munched on most of the winter, but they're starting to show off a bit. But that bluish purple color looks great with this variegation and these super, super showy flowers. Again, it's not in full flower. This is the third year in the ground for this. Uh, we moved it again a couple times. And so this is the first year it's doing this. And I think every one of these stems in the next week or two will be showing off like this. But most of the time, what you're gonna see is slender dutzia when you go shopping for it. But this is another species that's really, really interesting and has this great kind of flowy habit and super, super showy in the spring. And then even after it finishes flowering, spring and su early summer, it'll have this variegation the rest of the summer. So there you go. There's some of the odd jobs that we have going on in the Raleigh garden and some of the flowering uh, plants that are showing off. Is there anything interesting in your garden? Uh, that you'd like to uh, to tell us about, uh, let us know down below. And thanks for following along with the channel.